Good morning, everyone. This is the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara, our house of worship and spiritual home, where all people of goodwill are welcome. I hope you're all enjoying the weekend so far. We have red, white, and blue flowers on the, the altar in honor of the fourth. Julia is taking her summer leave. There was always a long-standing tradition that for some reason we got away from, which was to ask first-time visitors or returning visitors to just raise their hands so uh, that we can get to know you during our time of fellowship uh, following the service. Anyone visiting here uh, this morning? All right. A special welcome to you. Be sure to sign our uh, guest book and stay after so that we may greet you more personally. To all this morning, we will be hearing from some of your fellow members and friends sharing their summer stories. It's a quick announcement, but I want to let you know about a really special event coming up on J Friday, July 21st, as part of the Justice and Equity Team's Summer of Pride. The Justice and Equity Team and the membership team are hosting a congregational potluck and drag queen bingo. And this is going to be so much fun. You do not want to miss this. Cooper the Queen is not only talented and charismatic, Cooper is also a UU, believe it or not. So um, Cooper's going to be regaling us with Drag Queen Bingo. This is an all-ages event, so sign up for a potluck dish. You can sign up at the membership table starting this morning at coffee hour. And um, those of you online, stay tuned for more details. Thank you. As we light our chalice, if you are participating from home, type chalice is lit and add the name of your street into the chat box. For the gift of this day and for our community of spiritual nurture and compassion, we give thanks. We light this chalice as a symbol of the faith that sustains us. May our many sparks meet and merge in the communion of heart and soul. you to add to our change jar 
something positive and hopeful you either uh, experienced or noticed recently. I was ready to cite the Supreme Court's rejection of the individual state's attempts to alter and even void federal elections in their ruling on Monday. But the court's subsequent decisions this week took away my enthusiasm for that. And two weeks ago, at our Father's Day service, I celebrated the birth of our grandson, so he's already in the jar. If you'll bear with me, I will make my summer uh, story the contribution to the change jar, and I'll share that with you a little later. Please rise and body your spirit as we sing our opening hymn, number 66, When the Summer Sun is Shining. celebrate uh, people's birthdays during uh, July. And so, you'll see their pictures up there, all our members who are born in July. And if you are here uh, and born in July, come on up for your star. And uh, I must say, this is a very special event for me because I was born in July. So, I'm going to get a star also. And uh, if you're feeling, uh, feeling like it, just state your name and uh, when you were born. Uh, actual age is optional. We can do the math. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. 
<laughs> My name is Dorothy Warnock, and I was born in July 17th, 1938. My name is Florence Michelle. I was born in July of 1931, which makes me 92 Ooh. this year. Yeah, congrats. Your turn, Joy. My name is Joy Wano, and I'm going to turn five year old in July, July 15th. My name is Kat Crawford, and my birthday is July 16th, 1951. I'm Peter Hale. I was born on July 10th, 1947, and I'm 70. Am I seven, I'm not 76 yet, am I? It's coming up. I'm Ellie Grogan, and I share a birthday with Sarah uh, on the 28th. My birthday is July 28th, and I was born in 1942. Hi, I'm Chris. My daughter, Georgia, will be two on July 20th. Do you want one too? Just cause, yeah. <laughs> Gotta give the big brother a star too. <laughs> well, happy birthday, everybody. time of the morning when we ask anyone who feels like sitting on a rug to come up front for a time for all ages. I brought my beach chair this morning. I know it's not exactly beach weather yet, but um, I'm going to invite you all to go on a little uh, trip to the beach with me right now. Oh, we've got a few more kids coming up. Great. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to go to the beach right now here at church? Good. Yes, a story, but it's even more than a story. I'm going to ask everyone, if you're feeling comfortable with it, to close your eyes right now. And I am going to um, take you on a trip to the beach with me. So now that your eyes are closed, pay attention to the rise and fall of your breath, just like the ocean waves rise and fall. Breathe in, breathe out. Again, breathe in, breathe out. One more time, big breath in and out. Let's imagine we're all kicking off our shoes and stepping onto the warm sand. It's not too hot today. It's not burning our feet, just warming them nicely as we walk across the beach to our perfect spot close to the ocean. Can you hear the waves and the seagulls calling us? Feel the breeze against your skin and in your hair, if, if you have hair. <laughs> Some of you might not, I'm sorry. <laughs> As we walk to the ocean and feel the warm sun on your face and arms and the sand between your toes, smell the salt air. And as we get closer to the ocean's edge, the sand begins to feel damp and cool. Take your first step into the water now. How does it feel? Is it cold or is it just right? Let's all wade in up to our knees now. Our upper bodies are still warm in the sun, but as we walk deeper into the water, our legs are feeling the chill of the ocean. As we go out a little deeper, we might feel a silky strand of kelp wrap around our leg. That's okay, just kick it aside and get ready because the waves are just the right size to dive through. Everybody ready? Take a deep breath and dive through the next wave. Whew. 
As you come out on the other side, feel the salt water dripping from your hair and face and notice how alive that cold water makes you feel. It's like drinking an espresso shot, just wakes you right up. Now turn over and float on your back. The salt water will hold you up and help you float. Feel the warm sun on your face, the cool water on your back, and listen to the waves sloshing around in your ears. Let's just float here for a minute with our eyes closed. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry. Let's walk back up to our towels and dry off. I'll get the lunch out. My grandma always made egg salad sandwiches on soft, squishy bread for the beach when I was a kid, so that's what I brought for today. I hope you like it. And I'll tear open a bag of chips, taste that good, crunchy saltiness. Yum, who doesn't like salty chips at the beach? Oh, and, and I brought um, some nice juicy nectarines, so take a bite and let the juice dribble down your chin. Don't worry, I've got napkins. Isn't that juicy and sweet? When was the last time you built a sand castle? Let's go back to the water's edge and kneel down on the wet sand, scoop out some sand with your hands or a shovel, Use it to start building the foundation for your castle. Let's spend a moment building our sandcastle in our imagination. Does yours have a moat? How many towers does it have? Will you decorate it with rocks and shells? Close your eyes and imagine the sandcastle that you are building. What beautiful castles we all built. In a few hours, the tide will come in and gently wash them away, making room for another day, another castle. Let's brush the sand off our hands and run into the ocean to cool off. Ready, set, go. Ah, that water is so refreshing. Now let's grab our towels and rub ourselves dry. Before we go, we'll stop at the snack bar for an ice cream cone. What flavor will you get? I got salted caramel. Take a lick of that sweet, cold, creamy goodness. Ooh, can you feel that ice cream on your tongue? Well, it's time for us to get back to church now. So take one last look around at the beach and the ocean in your imagination. Smell the salt air and listen to the waves. And now take a deep breath and slowly open your eyes and return to church. We're back. I hope you all had a good time. And that is our time for all ages today. And now the kids and I are going to go out and see what we can create in Makerspace. Thank you. Get out of my chair. My name is Linda Liker. I've been a member here for about 12 years, and I'm always glad to be here. My story today is one of my, some of you know, I tend to fall often. I think it's because I walk so many miles. Several years ago, my Weimaraner and I, some of you might have remembered Duke, he was stunningly beautiful. He died three years ago of old age. Anyway, I was at the farmer's market one Saturday morning and I decided I needed to get some miles in. 
So Duke and I walked from the market down to the beach, and we're walking along the beach, not the sidewalk, not the beach part. And when I was coming back across Cabrillo to go up Castillo, back to the market, for reasons I will never understand, I turned and looked at the, the car that had stopped. I was at the light, I had the light, but, and all of a sudden I found myself going face first onto the street. <sighs> People stopped, they called the police, the fire department, the ambulance, the whole schmear, and Duke thought it was very entertaining because he saw all these people he didn't know and he could talk to all of them. And it was really fun for him. And they talked back to him. They tried to convince me to go to the hospital. I wouldn't go. My mouth was killing me. I don't remember if there was much blood, but my mouth hurt. And I asked them if they had an ice pack and they had one of those bags you push the little button. It doesn't get cold enough, trust me. So I waited a little while, because I didn't have any ID on me, and all I had was some money in my pocket. I was going back to the market to go shopping. So Duke and I headed back, and I kept thinking, I really need an ice pack. But of course, what was I gonna do? This thing didn't work. So I stopped in a coffee shop, and I pleaded with them to give me a bag with ice in it. And the guy comes out with ice wrapped in saran wrap and it leaked everywhere as it was, I'm holding it. And I kept thinking, what? I need a plastic bag. I kept walking and it's dripping and it's not being able to hold on. And it suddenly dawned on me, I was almost back to the market. I went, Linda, you've got a doggy bag. Every dog walker's got a doggy bag, come on. So I took the, one of the doggy bags, actually I took two, and put the ice in it, tied a knot, and here I am walking with a doggy bag, and you know what they look like, on my face like this, you know. <laughs> I thought it was perfectly hysterical. I thought it was really fun and funny. And I get back to the market and everybody's going, what happened to you? I fell down again? Okay, um, I tend to do that. So anyway, that's my story, is falling down and walking around with a doggy bag. And what I realized is, you need to always stay in the moment. Don't, especially when you're walking. If you want to look at something, stop and look at it. Don't keep walking and trying to look because boom, down you go. Um, and then I just wanted to leave you with a quote from Leonard Cohen from his anthem. Ring, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I did have to have my front teeth replaced. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm Marty Connolly. Um, I was married in that garden about uh, 42 years ago with my wife, Kate. And here I am today. Uh, Peter asked me for a summer story, and here's the one I wrote. The summer I learned how to swim. Along the New River in North Carolina, we spent our summer days catching fireflies in mason jars raising chameleon lizards in terrariums that we made, and netting blue crabs off the pilings of our pier. We ran after the truck spraying for mosquitoes in our backyards because we enjoyed the scent. I was nine years old. Willie Lucky, Reggie Van Stockham, and I were children of Marines living in officers' quarters at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Yes, the same Camp Lejeune with the TV ads about cancer-causing, chemically contaminated water. The woods were adjacent to our riverfront homes, 
Across the street was the base golf course. I don't remember seeing any adults there. It seemed mostly deer played golf. Our area was a natural paradise for adventures. After I saw the film Huckleberry Finn, I decided to build myself a raft. Down by the river, I made a barely floatable craft from some two by four lumber and nails. I invited Willie, Reggie, my mother, some neighbors, and Sergeant Reese and Corporal Savoy, who both lived with our family, to watch my launch. Fully clothed, I pushed my raft into the river. Five yards, 10 yards from shore, so far, so good. Then the current picked up and took me farther into the New River's two-mile-wide estuary that ultimately flows into the Atlantic Ocean. What do I do, Ma? I shouted. I'll never forget my mom yelling back, swim, Marty, swim. <laughs> I jumped off my raft. The cool river water chilled my body, came up my nose and tasted bad. My wet shirt and waterlogged jeans weighed me down. Somehow I dog paddled to shore. I felt more like Huck Finn than ever before. One day in the woods, we came upon a manhole size opening in the ground. We lowered ourselves down and explored the pit with flashlights. Strangely, it had a brick lined roof. Perhaps it was an abandoned well? We lifted ourselves out and vowed to keep our new hideout a secret. But the pit exploration whetted our appetites for more adventure. Another day, Willie, Reggie, and I brought shovels down to the riverbank and began tunneling into the bluffs. We know nothing about cave building. All too suddenly, there was a landslide. I was buried up to my neck. Willie was buried with only his two feet showing. Reggie ran to get help. Sergeant Reese soon arrived and dug around my shoulders and pulled me out by my armpits. Corporal Savoy and others dug out Willie. He was unconscious and taken to the hospital. Willie was lucky in name and in fate. He survived. Soon thereafter, we confessed the location of our brick-lined well. Our parents had it filled to the top with sand. My parents bought me a beagle puppy to keep me closer to home. At the end of the summer, we moved to a new assignment, as military families often do. I never saw Willie, Reggie, Sergeant Reese, or Corporal Savoy again. I swim three times a week now. The water temp is often warmer than the air temp. The water is clean, clear, and smells nice. When I enter the pool, I sometimes recall that day on the New River and my mother. You see, summertime can give you memories, memories that last a lifetime. Swim, Marty, swim, my mother said. Each week we donate 25% of our offering to a worthy cause or organization. This month it will be shared with the UU Justice Ministry of California, which since 2000 has worked to translate the principles and values of our faith into public policy. Their list of accomplishments is long. You can read about their work and accomplishments on their website, UUJMC. If you wish to contribute directly to this organization and are writing a check, just write those letters, UUJMC, 
in the memo line. Please read with me the affirmation of gratitude and giving printed in your order of service or up on the sanctuary screen. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs, so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Light changed the order of service. I'll be singing John Rutter's arrangement of For the Beauty of the Earth. Good morning, my name is Craig Woodman, and uh, my summer story is about travel. And travel teaches you to roll with the punches, and so it's fitting that we couldn't get my slides up on the screen, so we're rolling on without them. Everybody who knows my wife and I knows that we love to travel. Short trips, long trips, it doesn't matter. We love exploring new places both in the U.S. and abroad. One common thread of our travels is we always look for opportunities to be physically active and to experience exceptional natural wonders, historic sites, and, when possible, different cultures. Coming from Santa Barbara, we don't travel to get away from it all, but to embrace the beauty and complexity of the world and those who share it with us. We travel to learn. This summer, we were fortunate enough to spend a month in Slovenia and Croatia with side trips to neighboring countries, plus a few extra days in Amsterdam on the way back. We biked, hiked, rafted, sailed, and explored the area's natural wonders and charming towns and cities rich with history. Our story began when we flew into Slovenia after a 24-hour trip made longer by an air traffic controller strike in Paris, and we barely made it in time to pick up our rental car. We drove to Lake Bled, slide one, oops, sorry, <laughs> a mountain resort with magnificent alpine vistas, a medieval castle perched high above the lake, and a fairy tale island we could row a boat to and did and ate gelato. 
and it provided easy access to river rafting and hiking along beautiful streams and rushing waters. It soothed our weary souls and healed our bodies to be in such beauty. Another place we visited for its sheer beauty was Croatia's Plitvica National Park, one of Europe's most spectacular natural wonders consisting of 16 naturally terraced lakes and stunning waterfalls everywhere you walked. This part of the trip did test our patience as our traveling companions navigated incorrectly, adding hours to the trip. They were upset. They were upset as we spent extra time on narrow, winding, mountainous roads. We've learned to let such things go, however, because travel, as I mentioned, teaches you to quickly just roll with the punches and that life is easier when you are fanatically positive and relentlessly optimistic, as Rick Steve tells us. Plus, detours from our plans usually give us really good stories to tell. Did I tell you about the time we accidentally took the wrong road and blew through a border crossing in Bosnia only to be stopped by an angry, arm-waving, gun-toting border guard? Yeah I, yeah, I guess I just have. One of our most moving experiences, though, was a trip to Mostar in Bosnia-Herzegovina. This, Like Slovenia and Croatia, this area was once part of Yugoslavia. And during the Tito years, Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, and Muslim Bosniaks lived in relative harmony. The old bridge that spans the river, beautiful, once symbolized Yugoslavia's vision of ethnic peace, but civil war, as we know, broke out in the 1990s after Tito died, and that bridge was bombed and destroyed. Now rebuilt by hand, the old bridge once again symbolizes peaceful coexistence of its people. To get a good introduction to the area's complex history, we hired a wonderful guide, Alma, who lived through the war and its brutalities. As we learned from her and others, the war and its terrible memories are never far from the minds of former Yugoslavians. Although people, depending on who you talk to, had different perspectives on who inflicted the greatest horrors, everyone agreed that war was not a solution. Connecting with those who have experienced the horrors of a civil war was a sobering experience and made it all the more real for us who have never had to endure such things. We gain compassion for others and a greater understanding of history when we have such experiences. Nowhere was conflict uh, between religions more evident than at the amazing Diocletian Palace in split Croatia. Diocletian was renowned for murdering thousands of Christians and their saints. After his death, Christians got their revenge by building a beautiful cathedral over his mausoleum. Makes me glad to be a Unitarian. A highlight of our trip was a week aboard a 54-foot sailboat with four other passengers and Marin, our young Croatian captain. We embarked from Dubrovnik, Croatia, one of the most beautiful towns in all of Europe. We sailed from one beautiful island to another with stops for swimming and sightseeing. And each day we docked at a different island, walked and biked the narrow streets of the red tiled towns that looked like Santa Barbara from above. We ate at fantastic local restaurants and sampled local wines and olive oils. Pulling into the island where our young captain was born, we drove into the mountains and met his parents who make olive oils and amazing red and white wines. We sat down to a fantastic spread of meats, breads, and fish and were served large pours of each of their wines, and it was delicious. During our week-long boat trip, we learned much about life in Croatia from our young captain, including what his life is like constantly sailing the Adriatic during the tourist season with little time for his young son and his girlfriend. It's not a life we would choose, but Croatians have been sailors 
for time immemorial and he can imagine doing anything else it was a fine way to end our boat trip amsterdam was our last stop in a big change crisscrossed with charming canals and blessed with stunning architecture and world-class museum amsterdam is a great example of alternate ways of organizing a city and its people for example the city is traversed by a fantastic system of inexpensive all-electric trams and each day the city bustles with literally hundreds of thousands of bicyclists traveling along well wide well marked and safe bike lanes there are few cars because everyone takes trams and bikes what a difference from the u.s another example of amsterdam's different approach to life is its legalization and strict regulation of marijuana use and prostitution. Rick Steves, our travel guru, says the Dutch aren't really more permissive, but more pragmatic. They have found that when prostitution is illegal, you get pimps, mobsters, and the spread of STDs. And when marijuana is illegal, you get drug dealers, gangs, and violent turf wars. Their approach is to minimize such problems through strict regulation and control. Whether we agree or not, Amsterdam's alternative approach to social problems is thought provoking. Another striking difference is almost complete absence of police on the street. When we asked a local about that, he said, well, you know, there are cameras everywhere and old people who report crime. When asked if guns were legal, he was shocked and said, no, the only reason to have guns is to kill people. What a difference from America. Our many experiences on this trip and the many people we met reinforced the idea that we all belong to a global family of good people living their lives in different ways, but with the same goals, to live our lives with meaning and with peace love and happiness that's one reason we travel thank you so it was friday just two weeks ago Summer had just started, and I was on my way to the county courthouse hall of records to do some business for a client. In a hurry, of course, even though it's never good to be in a hurry when dealing with bureaucracy. But I was in luck. There were only two people in line, a couple. I stood behind them. The young man had a tall collar buttoned all the way up to just below his, his ears and a wide tie. The cuffs of his shirt covered the backs of his hands. Dressed in a tan suit, he seemed nervous, uh, dancing one from one foot to another in his brightly polished brown leather shoes. He had a red carnation in his lapel and his shiny black hair was cut in a fade. If you don't know what that is, it means closely shaved on the side and a top knot. She was dressed in white and holding a bouquet of white roses with uh, white and yellow flowers in her hair. Her arms uh, covered down to her fingers uh, likewise. And uh, she seemed nervous also held on to her companion for support while she rocked back and forth on what were perhaps unfamiliar high heels. Another woman was talking to the clerk behind the counter and going back and forth from him to the couple, talking to them in Spanish, but with an accent I couldn't quite place, maybe Central American back and forth, translating, obviously. Finally, the clerk called them up, indicating that they should please stand 
facing each other. Their friend continuing to translate and recording the proceedings on her iPhone. Another clerk appeared who could speak to them directly without the need of translation. If he hadn't guessed already, oh my gosh, they were going to get married. But they hadn't gotten very far into the ceremony when the young man whispered something to the woman who was translating. She went and consulted with the clerk, who I could see nodding, uh, mm -hmm, sure. She looked around. She looked at me and came over. She touched my arm and said, we need a witness. Will you please be our witness? Well, I, I, uh, wouldn't family be better or, or a friend? No, no, she said. It's a civil ceremony. They, they want it to be someone they don't know. <laughs> but I really don't understand what's being said. It doesn't matter. Come on. I stood to the side, but close enough to see the bride in tears, but smiling and laughing at the same time. The groom looked at her as if she was the only thing in his universe. Of course, they seem very, very young. But I'm 75. Everybody looks young to me. I wondered they, why they were here and not in a church uh, with family and loved ones. My presence and the courthouse staff all looking on seemed uh, inadequate. Was this a east side, west side thing? Romeo and Juliet? Were these two kids outcasts against the world? Or simply economizing with a big fiesta later on? They looked deliriously happy. Rings were exchanged, the bride kissed, and it was over. The three of them left, and I took care of filing my papers. But they were still outside as I left, looking at the video their companion had made, and now pointing at me. Look, the groom said, with a difficult accent to understand, but he said, Look, he held up the phone. Thank you for being part of our wedding. Whenever we watch this, there you'll be. <laughs> All right, if this is as close to eternity as I ever get, it will do. I wished them luck and just then remembered I had been in a hurry. Hopeful, very hopeful and is my contribution to our change jar. Because when you make a vow to love and honor another person, it changes you. It can change the world. When you sign the membership book here, it changes you. It could change the world. I didn't speak the language, but I still understood <laughs> that in spite of all that's wrong with the world and the challenges ahead, people are still joining hands and making promises to be together, to stay together, willing to face the uncertainty of the future with tears, smiles, and laughter. Our closing hymn is number 21 in the gray book or on the sanctuary screen. Please rise and when we're done singing, re remain standing and join hands. Even across the aisle, we could use as much of that as we can get.
the days to come, if you are asked to share your story during a service, I hope you consider it. The view from the congregation is beautiful. The view from up here is grand. Nothing will cement your relationship with this society more completely than receiving the affirmation of your fellow UUs. Stories, those that are told about us and those we tell about ourselves are how we know each other. And that knowledge, that familiarity, camaraderie and fellowship is the essence of community. And community is the foundation of our faith. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Then let's call out a blessing. <laughs>